23 when my father passed away and uh, I was an only child and I had no other family and I had to take on the role as the sole carer for my mother who had been diagnosed with a degenerative nerve disease. And I loved her dearly and there was no question that I would move in and look after and do whatever it took. But she was very eccentric, she was very unconventional and she basically had zero concept of what was involved in looking after her. Like she would basically message and call me all day even though we're in the same house like from the kitchen to the living room and send me to the shops like for, you know, a tub of connoisseur ice cream. You get to the end of the day and you've been to IGA ten times for one item. Um, and so the penny dropped, I think, um, when I went to a doctor's appointment. Mum had done a stint in hospital and the doctor said to me, um, I just want to talk about, you know, go through the team um, that look after mum. So, um, can you talk me through the team? And I was like, well, I kind of am the team. And he was like, oh, my goodness. He was so shocked. Um, he said, I have no idea how you do it because she has literally run our shift workers off their feet. We've got two people on stress leave. <laughs> and... Um, Julie's been here for 20 years and she's just taken her first in of long service leave. <laughs> um, so I honestly have no idea how you do it. And I, I was like, yeah, it feels like a bit like, I don't know, maybe working at Buckingham Palace, but <laughs> like being the only staff member there <laughs> and with no pay and <laughs> no palace. Um, So um, I met a guy and I knew it was a catch when he agreed to move in um, with me and mum. Because I was pretty aware that I wasn't a great package deal at 23. Like, hi, I'm 23. My name's Rachel. I live at home with my mum and I spent a lot of time at IGA. Did you want to move in? Um, it was kind of a case of beggars cannot be choosers. <laughs> so Phil was a lovely guy, very shy and retiring type and meant he was a bit of a target for mum. So <laughs> he quickly became sort of like, you know, the waiter in um, Faulty Towers. <laughs> he was just like run off his feet. Anyway, we both finished university and landed dream jobs. We've both gone to law school and um, we thought, oh, we better step things up a notch and get a carer in for mum because we're going to be, like, working hardcore. We're not going to be able to manage her during the day. The only person that didn't get that memo was mum. So <laughs> instead of calling us from the kitchen to the living room, she just called on the daily while we're at work. Um, and my job was... My first job was working for a judge in the Supreme Court and I remember being in this huge trial and it was like the last day of the trial and the judge was going to deliver his decision and at a quite a crucial moment the orderly, the court orderly came in and was like, sorry Rachel, could you, um, your mum's on the phone? And I was like, <laughs> just tell her I'll ring her back. He's like, no, no, she says it's an emergency. So I rushed out and I, I, we're in like a open plan staff room and so everyone's sort of looking at me waiting to see what's going on. I was like, Mum, she's like, Rach, I've been on a four-day fast and there's absolutely no sugar bananas here. Could you <laughs> pick some up? I said, Mum, this is not the time or the place. I'm in the middle of a massive trial. She was like, do you think I'd be calling you if this was not an SOS emergency, Rach? <laughs> Did you not hear me? I said, I have not eaten in four days. I'm absolutely famished. I said, Mum, somebody's life is on the line here. She went, I don't care if he lives or dies. <laughs> Frankly, I may not be alive by tonight when you get home, so that's on you. Who are you going to pick, me or him? I was like, <laughs> oh, my God. And I'm looking at everyone staring at me, and I was like, Mum, this sugar banana discussion has to be shelved. And I went to hang up on her and she was like, speaking of shelves, can you go to the Wangara markets? Because the ones at the boat shed are just always so bruised. And I was like, Ch -ch beep, beep. Like, absolutely mortified. I shuffled back into court and the judge says to me, is everything all right? I was like, oh, sorry, that was just my mum. He was like, is it 
was an emergency and I realised I'm going to have to say something because he's wondering why I've left, you know, at a crucial time. I was, but I didn't think it through, so I just said, oh, she's been on a fast and wanted sugar bananas. He went, sorry, what? <laughs> anyway, um, so... I got home that night and um, Phil was there with a huge box of sugar bananas and it looked like he'd bought the frippin' tree. <laughs> and I said, oh, did you get the call about the sugar bananas as well? He's like, Rach, I was in the middle of a native title determination, <laughs> which has been decades in the making, and the community manager came in in the middle of it saying there was an SOS about sugar bananas. <laughs> I don't even know how she got the community manager's phone number. All I know is that I'm going to lose my job <laughs> if it keeps up. And I was like, so look, we bought her a car because we thought maybe she could just get her own sugar bananas. She's a terrible driver, but if we get her a car and it's just down the road, hopefully, take a bit of the burden off. Um, so she demanded Phil jump in the car for a test drive. She knew I wouldn't get in. Um, so he obliged and I saw them putt down the road at 20 k's an hour. And then all of a sudden the passenger door opens and Phil just did this commando roll <laughs> out the, onto the park that we were living opposite. He was like, Joan, I do a lot of things for you. I'm, this is one step just too far. I will not be a passenger in your car. Um, you know, and then there was a time when I was in another trail... And my, I could see my mobile, which I'd forced her to now call my mobile. Everybody was banned from ringing me at work in court. But I saw the mobile flashing several times. So I ran to the bathroom, picked up a voicemail and it was mum's carer. And she left a message going, Hello, Rachel, it's Beverly here from Brightwater. There's been an incident, a very serious incident with your mother and pancakes. Can you please call me urgently? <laughs> I was like... And then I see another voicemail and it's from Phil and he's in the middle of the desert and he's on a satellite phone and there's like a croaky, something's happened, Beverly from Brightwater, there's been a pancake, <laughs> something's happened, you need to contact them because they've found me in the desert. Like you couldn't even go to the middle of the desert without her, <laughs> someone finding you, like... Um, Anyway, so it turns out the pancake incident was essentially mum put a stack of pancakes in the microwave for what she thought was four minutes and then took off to have a nap. But it turns out that she put them on for four hours. <laughs> so um, Beverly arrived and, of course, the microwave had exploded and there was literally pancakes from here to kingdom come. And poor Beverly actually slipped on one of the stairs going down. So, yeah, we didn't, um, Beverly didn't stay long. <laughs> but, um, yeah, you know, there's just so many stories like that. We, Mum wanted to move to the seaside, so she made us sell the family home to move to something that was quarter the size because she was like, if I get sea air, I'll be cured. And I was like, I'm pretty sure it doesn't cure... Pretty sure there's no evidence for um, sea air curing a degenerative nerve disease, but we'll give it a go. Um, and I remember being like in the courtyard of the place waiting for the agent to drop off. Um, she was dropping off the keys and mum was like, I need to go to the toilet. We were like, well, just wait because the agent's coming. And she's like, there's a fish pond there. And I was like, absolutely not. Just wait for five minutes. Like, and Phil was like, oh, Joan, please don't. Just, <laughs> we've moved to a very posh suburb. Anyway, I'll just leave you to think about what went down there when the agent <laughs> arrived. Mum said, I own this fish pond. I'll do what the hell I want with it. <laughs> Look, um, I mean, there are just so many stories I could go for a long time. Basically, 15 years. Um, went past of her being a royal pain in the backside. Um, but she passed away a couple of years ago and, you know, those stories, these stories that I'm telling you about now are basically my tonic and they're my remedy, I guess, for 
the pain that I felt, this immeasurable pain that I felt when I walked in and found that room empty. And the pain of no longer getting those calls every day. Um, yeah, it's kind of been a long and tumultuous relationship for me with pain. But I think if I've learnt anything, it's that, um, you know, if you've got someone in your life that you love deeply and they, they're challenging and, you know, they can be painful to deal with, um, just hold on tight because you never know when those stories are sort of going to become your light in the darkness. You know, so I remember the last day before Mum passed away, her heart was giving away and we had a meeting and the intensive care doctor came to deliver the news to us with Mum that she could not be resuscitated again. We'd already resuscitated her four times and he said, you know, the next time you slip into a coma, that's the last time um, that we're going to be able to... Um, we're going to be able to revive you. And there was a deep, um, you know, tension and sadness in the room, obviously, and um, he said, would anyone like to ask any questions? And I don't think anyone knew what to do in that moment. But all of a sudden, Mum was like, I'd like to ask a question. And everyone, the doctor looked relieved and we all thought, oh, great. he was like, oh, yes, please, please do. We'd like to discuss it. And she said, um, would it be all right if I had a chocolate drumstick? <laughs> Um, <laughs> and Phil and I just burst out laughing and he was sort of like... <laughs> <laughs> and then he came over to me and was like, I don't wish to be the bearer of any further bad news today, but she is charted up for a very serious dairy allergy. <laughs> and I said, honestly, let's just wave the dairy allergy and get her a chocolate drumstick. Thank you so much. <laughs>